Hey everyone, I'm Jensen. Today is Monday, November 30th, and from articles of impeachment filed against Ohio Governor Mike DeWine to one local school pushing back on county health orders, I have all the stories you need to know to get in the loop today. But first, let's take a look at some more immediate news, which is our weather. Today and tomorrow are both first alert days because of the wintry weather that we're having. Our first alert weather team says areas of snow will continue tonight and through much of tomorrow. So temperatures near and above freezing will cause some slushy accumulations on roads. So some icy spots are possible. Be safe out there. And what everyone wants to know, here are some of the predicted snow totals by the end of it. So around tomorrow at five o'clock, Toledo might be looking at around an inch of snow and higher accumulations are coming in a little bit further east, but we will keep you updated throughout the night as we learn more. You can download our free first alert weather app and get them from the meteorologists directly. And we want to see your snow pictures. If you take any pretty pictures of what your neck of the woods look like, just send it to us at 419-248-1100. And while we're on this subject, could it be another Christmas weed in honor of the first snow? Just look at this little guy spreading cheer in what, of course, has been a bit of a difficult year. So if you missed out on all the buzz over the city's littlest celebrity two years ago, I'll try to quickly get you up to speed. Back in 2018, a family decided to brighten up the city by decorating a large weed that they'd stumbled across growing at the intersection of Secor and Alexis. Well, when people saw that, more and more jumped on board and they kind of grew bigger than what anyone really anticipated. There were carols, there were t-shirts, and there was even a book written about it. Mayor Wade Caps the Cabbage signed an official proclamation from the city celebrating the camaraderie that the little shrub brought to the 419. So last year, someone did try to keep the tradition alive, but it never really lived up to its former glory. But who knows this year? Maybe we'll see something a bit more festive. You know, it's 2020, anything, anything can happen. And while we are looking locally, I do want to shift gears a little bit here and take a look at what one school is doing to push back a little bit on county health orders. St. John's Jesuit is moving forward with sports despite Lucas County Regional Board of Health's order requiring schools to go remote and essentially putting a pause on winter sports. So as a recap, if you missed it, the order passed last week and goes into effect on December 4th at 4 p.m. and lasts until January 11th at 8 p.m. AM. In short, it says that 7th through 12th grade students must learn remotely in that time period. Um, K through 6 students are really up to the school's discretion though, so they can learn if person if deemed necessary. And sports and extracurriculars are not able to move forward in school buildings, which is important for what we're talking about because in an email sent to St. John's parents today, it was announced that the school student athletes would in fact continue to practice and play. Um, just in off-campus locations. So the order was reviewed and school lawyers were consulted before the decision was made. Um, so for basketball and wrestling, they're moving off campus and all contests will be away. Swimming will practice at UT and compete in away meets. Hockey will continue at Sylvania Tam O'Shanner as normal with practices and home games played there and away games played on the road, of course. But be aware, all of this is subject to change. It is a fluid situation. But of course, COVID-19 protocols will be followed no matter what. Uh, Dr. Chris Brickman, the team doctor for sports at St. John's, reportedly supports this plan that they've put in place, and it will be reviewed weekly. So if Lucas County were to elevate to level four purple on the state's coronavirus map, then the school says that all sports activities would be, quote, forced to shut down. So we'll keep you updated on that. Um, but for reference, what exactly is happening statewide? Well, let's take a look at what Governor Mike DeWine discussed today at his latest coronavirus press conference. The focus lately really has been on hospitals. So there are currently 5,060 COVID-19 patients in Ohio's hospitals. On November 1st, for reference, there were just under 1,700 patients. So the state has seen an increase of 200% in just the last 30 days. The big concern is for ICUs. Of those more than 5,000 current patients, 1,180 of them are in the ICU. So Dr. Andy Thomas with the Wexner Medical Center said hospitals are worried about their ability to manage the growing number of patients and are starting to have to make some tough decisions about delaying care. Uh, he said one out of every three people on a ventilator is someone with COVID and that eventually they will crowd out other people who need that care if these numbers were to continue to rise. Another issue hospitals have been seeing, and they've been saying it for weeks now, 
is that they are short staffed. They're lacking trained personnel because staff is continuing to get sick or they're stuck in quarantine because it's getting harder and harder to avoid the virus while out in the community. So there were actually four nurses who joined in on today's press conference who shared what it looks like on the inside. And two of them said, so they just want to take people through these COVID units or wear a camera when they're going through their shift just so people in the public can see what it's like. But one said, on the other hand, she doesn't want anyone to have to see what they see. So uh, I think it's really important to hear directly from them what they're seeing instead of hearing it relayed by me. So I have links to their portion of the press conference in the description of this video if you want to hear things from their perspective. And... In response to DeWine's approach to the pandemic, 12 articles of impeachment against him were officially filed today by members of his own Republican Party. State Representative John Becker of Claremont County was joined by fellow representatives Nino Vitale, Candace Keller, and Paul Zeltwanger in filing the articles as an, quote, effort to restore the rule of law. So the articles claim DeWine has abused his power as governor and has violated both the Ohio and U.S. Constitution as well as the Ohio Revised Code. So back in August, Becker actually drafted 10 articles um, against DeWine to, quote, ending the madness. Uh, but Speaker of the House Bob Cup, Republican from Lima, refused to take those articles to a vote. So now Becker is calling again on Cup to assign the articles of impeachment immediately to the Federalism Committee, aiming for these hearings to happen in December, so just next month. Um, but we haven't heard anything more on that, so I'll keep you updated if anything does move forward. And President-elect Joe Biden got his first look at the President's Daily Brief today. The brief is a top-secret summary of U.S. intelligence and world events, which former First Lady Michelle Obama has called the Death, Destruction, and Horrible Things book. Biden has already had eyes on at least three different styles of this so-called PDB, which is tailored to the way each president likes to receive and absorb information. So... More than a decade ago, Biden read former President George W. Bush's PDB during his transition to the vice presidency. After that, he, of course, read uh, former President Obama's PDB for eight years. And now, after a four-year break, he's reading President Donald Trump's. President Trump reportedly prefers absorbing this information in visual ways, like short texts and graphics. And that's often followed up by verbal briefings by an intelligence official. So from now until Inauguration Day, Biden and Vice President-elect Kamala Harris will be reading the PDB that's been drafted for Trump. Um, and he, of course, delayed giving Biden and Harris access to it as he continues to contest the outcome of the election. And while all of this has been going on, First Lady Melania Trump availed the White House Christmas decorations. See, we're kind of coming full circle here. This year's theme is America the Beautiful. Ornaments on the official Christmas tree in the Blue Room were designed by students from across the country who were asked by the National Park Service to highlight the people, places, and things that make their state beautiful. I love that. First responders and frontline workers coping with the ongoing pandemic are recognized with the tree and other decorations in the Red Room. And... This is exciting to me. The annual gingerbread White House, made up of more than 400 pounds of dough, gum paste, chocolate, and royal icing, for the first time includes the Rose Garden, recently renovated by the First Lady, as well as the First Lady's Garden. So I'm sure that is a sight to see. And before I go, let me just share some exciting food news for those of you who like to hit the drive through like me. The McRib, which I've actually never tried before, is back starting today. And McDonald's will be giving away free McRibs to the first 10,000 people to show them their clean-shaven faces. Why, you may ask? Well, to mark the end of No Shave November. So whether you had a beard initially or... Not, it doesn't matter. Anyone can give it a go by posting a smooth face on their Twitter or Instagram account using the hashtag shave for McRib sweepstakes and tagging McDonald's. And it's not just good for you, it helps other people too. McDonald's is donating part of every McRib purchase on December 2nd to the nonprofit No Shave November, which raises funds for cancer research, prevention, and education. So there you go. Maybe I'll have to finally give it a try. But that is all I have for you today. If you like this video, hit that like button and subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Jensen, and now you are in the loop.